Today we are speaking with Catherine Preston, who is Director in Environmental Affairs with ACI North America. And Catherine, thank you so much for having this interview with me. I want to talk with you a little bit about biofuels. Particularly, what are the economics of biofuels? Are they competitive? I mean, are the economics of biofuels competitive today with fossil faced fossil fuels? Uh, well, I'm sure as, as you know, um, you know, biofuels are still in the development phase of the industry. I mean, they there's been a lot of work done, um, but the scale isn't really up to commercial scale yet. So the price of biofuels is more than jet fuel currently. Um, but with the way jet fuel prices have been over the past couple of years going up and down and a lot of market shocks, um, it's, it's really not too far off in the future. I don't know off the top of my head the exact um, price per gallon that, that biofuels are considered competitive, but I think it's around 130. Um, so, you know, when jet fuel is above 100, it's not too far off. Um, but we, we expect as the industry develops and it, it gets up to scale, the price would drop. The, the interesting thing here, obviously, is subsidies yeah. um, because there's a lot of testing going on. So someone's obviously chipping in. Um, just today, there was news that Aeromexico is doing a flight from Mexico City to Madrid, and uh, they're using a Boeing, and Boeing has very kindly stepped up to provide the fuel. Do you think that subsidies are going to be easy for airlines to get as they move into, let's say, from a testing phase to regular use phase? I think... Uh the environment in D.C. these days is going to be very difficult for anyone to get a, a subsidy um, for anything, really, let alone a new one that hasn't been given before. Um, I, I think the industry really would like to see parity with other forms of biofuels. So, um, you know, the, the ethanol bl uh, producer blender tax credit, um, something like that for, for aviation biofuels would be great. I think that's going to be phased out though. So I think any kind of subsidy is going to be difficult to come by, but there are a lot of programs out there that help um, producers and, um, and the industry. I know uh, USDA's Office of Rural Development has a loan, <clears throat> excuse me, loan guarantee program helping uh, folks build biorefineries in rural areas um, and other sorts of development programs. So there is help out there, but I think any kind of new subsidy program would be pretty difficult to come by these days. Okay. How will biofuels interact with existing in airport infrastructure? The goal is to have biofuels be completely drop-in. Um, that means that they would be able to use the same pipelines, the same transmission lines, everything. Um, all the infrastructure at airports, of the biofuels would be able to be completely drop-in um, because nobody wants to have to build new infrastructure. So that's definitely a key consideration as, um, as producers and airlines and airports and, and manufacturers like Boeing look ahead to this industry and developing biofuel, it's going to work. So I think anything that's not completely drop-in would be a non-starter. I guess since we, since the world is, is really starting off with blended versions, like right. the Aeromexico flight is 70-30, a lot of the European airlines that are doing testing are going to 50-50%. Mm -hmm. So drop-in is, is just the way it has to be because otherwise how would you get the blend to work, right? It, that's exactly right. So I know um, the ASTM has certified a 50-50 blend for hydro-processed jet fuels um, and, you know, they're working on other other percentages, but it's always going to have to be a blend, at least in the near term. The, the capacity is not there to provide enough biofuel to, to meet the airline's needs at 100%. Um, and there's also some technical issues with aromatics that, that come from um, conventional jet fuel that needs to be mixed in with the biofuels um, as well. But, you know, there is some flexibility for the percentage there, but it's at least in the near term, it's always going to be a blend. Okay, so this last week, we, there was really interesting news coming out of Detroit about the airport doing an experiment with the University of Michigan to grow some crops on land that they own to produce biofuels. Mm -hmm. um, what is the role do you think airports potentially play in the provision of biofuels, given the fact that they normally have a lot of space? Well, they do have um, a lot of space. I think at the, the Wayne County Airports Authority, which includes Detroit, has, um, I believe it was 1,700 acres available, and they've leased out just a few of them to the university for a pilot project to grow the crops. So there is space there. Um, but I think when you're looking at the capacity of how much fuel is actually needed uh, in, in the United States alone, you're going to need a lot more land than what just the airports have on site. Um, so it's going to be, you know, a much greater... Uh, 
you know, land use required other than just airports. So farmers are going to have to start growing these crops. Um, but, you know, the, it's an exciting project. I know they're looking at it, um, you know, possibly to expand. And they, I think they're using um, mustard seed and, and canola crops there. There's a whole bunch of different options that of feedstocks that can be turned into biofuels. So it's definitely an option for airports to, to grow it on site. But I think there's going to be... Um, a lot more land required, and, and certainly some airports are land constrained and, and don't have the capacity to grow the crops on site. So. The, the, the reason I got excited about this is because for obvious reasons, um, besides the PR, but for very practical reasons, it seems like a really good idea for an airport to start playing a role, even if, as you point out, they, they don't have enough land, but they do have a role to sort of get the, wheel, the wheels turning. And um, clearly, if the the uh, Detroit experiment works as they think it will to even supply diesel to the airport mm -hmm. vehicles. The, as you point out, the farmers in the in the in the region could become involved, and the wheels have now started turning, and there's momentum. I think that's the reason why I find airport being involved in this um, is a really good move. Right, and I know that there are um, there's a lot of airports that do have interests like Detroit, um, you know, the Port of Portland and Port of Seattle. Um, you know, the airports have been really involved with initiatives in the region, the the Sustainable Aviation Fuels Northwest or SAFN for short, and they have been involved with um, with airlines, with Boeing, with producers, and with um, academia as well in the area to figure out what role each of these stakeholders play and and how airports can be involved because. As you know, that's where airlines get their fuel, um, and I think uh, I think it's the the largest 75 airports in the United States um, account for 80 percent of the traffic of the of the passenger and cargo traffic. So that's a pretty small number of distribution sites when you compare it to gas stations for cars. Um, so it, you know, logistically, it would be a lot easier to have those distribution sites there. Um, so airports definitely play a role. I mean, they you know as, as witnessed by their involvement with the staff and they realize that they are stakeholders in this process too. So um, I think it's really important. The next thing I want to ask you about is there's so many biofuel types. There's, as you mentioned, um, mustard seed, mm -hmm. there's jatropha, there's yep. carmelina. It seems like, and you've got wood chips uh, that people are talking about in right. Seattle. I know in London, the British, uh, British Airways is involved with a trash recycling yeah. plant to try and create uh, biodiesel or something. What are what is the story with each one of these uh, feedstocks? There, uh, there's a number of feedstocks that that would be appropriate that are able to be turned into jet fuel. Um, I am no scientist; I'm not a technical expert, but I know there are several different types of kind of refining and processing techniques. When you're looking at crops for jet fuel, for oil seeds, for example, like jatropha or camelina, once you take that the raw biomass and you refine it the end result that you get is a jet fuel molecule that looks identical to a petroleum-based one. Um, so the end result from a couple from all these different feedstocks is going to be exactly the same. It's just the process of how you get there and how you refine it. Um, you know, I know, like I said, the ASTM is, has certified already, you know, um, hydro process, processing for jet fuels um, just actually last month. That's an interesting development. Um, but there is still some work to be done in refining for um, like woody biomass, like you said, wood chips and other kinds of biofuels. Um, but really when it comes down to it, the oil that you get, that you turn it into fuel, it's all the same in the end, which is why you can blend it um, with traditional jet fuel and why it works so well. I would imagine that for um, lots of countries in the world, like the Air New Zealand um, 747 that was tested with uh, jatropha-based mm -hmm. fuel, the fuel came from Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that the potential for having feedstocks, obviously, as you point out, that you know, some things grow better in parts of the world than others. So in terms of an agricultural viewpoint, all kinds of places around the world that may have not had the benefit of being a generator of, of fuel mm -hmm. could now potentially be that. Absolutely. Because of the wide range of, of different feedstocks and crops that can be used, um, you know, you, where, depending on what area you're in, you can look at your climate and your rainfall and, and what type of soil you have, and there's likely a crop that's going to fit that for you. Um, so you mentioned jatropha come from Tanzania. You know, they jatropha grows in a very different environment um, than camelina. Camelina does well in, in cooler environments, which is why it does well in the Pacific Northwest, and jatropha does well, you know, with a warmer tropical environment. So there's all sorts of 
different crops that can be used. I know halophytes are kind of um, grass that grow in brackish water, so you know you can't grow a normal crop and crop in um, brackish water. So there's there's really options for everything. So right. It's pretty exciting. And of course, there's also we haven't even mentioned this yet, but there's also the algae. Right? Yeah. Yep. Algae option. Yep. Um, I know algae. There have been test flights done with algae-based fuels and. Algae is considered kind of the gold standard by the industry because of the potential it holds to really produce, um, you know, all of the jet fuel that, that the industry could use um, one day in the future because algae is easy to, I should say not easy, it grows pretty quickly and it regenerates itself very quickly. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work being done with algae. I think there's, a, there's great potential there as well. What, what are there in terms of biohazards? that one has to worry about uh, in terms of um, a biofuel compared to a fossil fuel? Um, you know, I haven't really read or heard about anything specific or unique to biofuels um, in terms of any hazards as compared to jet fuel. Um, you know, I know the handling and the temperature range is, is, is pretty similar, so I don't know that any special uh, cautionary measures would have to be taken, um, you know, transporting or handling biofuels versus traditional jet fuel. Because uh, it, it, it sounds, for example, the algae story, um, it sounds almost like too good to be true, right? It's, it's it, it, you know, it's, there, is this, this, that there is this silver bullet that could work. Possibly. I mean, there's still a lot of research to be done. I know there's, there's research being done on different strains of algae and, you know, how you can um, increase the oil output and, and, you know, how you can produce enough of it to, to make all the fuel that the industry needs. Um, so it, it's tempting to think it's a silver bullet, but... Technology does have a long way to go, and, and there's always a cost concern. Um, but you know, as far as the hazards go, I really don't, I don't think that there's anything above and beyond what you would normally have to deal with um, with petroleum-based fuels. Thank you very much. You're welcome.